Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today Show. And today our topic matter by popular demand is youthful aging testosterone in men. And this is part one. There's no way I could have gone through all the information in just 20 minutes and address this issue. So I kind of want to define it, what happens when it falls, the testings that the docs should be completing, the cause of low testosterone, and some of the foods that can help support testosterone. On our uh, next show, we'll be addressing the supplements out there that have research that can support healthy testosterone levels. Definition. Now, testosterone is found in men and women, but it's the essential hormone necessary for proper sexual function and overall male vitality and youth. Now, when you're lacking testosterone, and particularly the active form called free testosterone, desire and performance for sex plummets. And we tend to see that happening in men right about age 40 and above on an average um, because they start something, believe it or not, called andropause in most men and we'll see a slight decline uh, in the testosterone or free testosterone levels. Now, that doesn't have to happen. Um, there are ways that we can keep a man young and virile throughout until he's in his 90s or 100. There's no reason for this dropping. If you have enough information to know why it falls, so when testosterone falls, you lose muscle tissue. Metabolic syndrome sets in, so you start gaining weight. Blood sugars go up. Now, when testosterone levels are low, your risk, cardiovascular risk of stroke and heart attack raises 40 to 70% because testosterone helps raise the HDL. When the testosterone falls, the HDL, which goes in and cleans up what we call the good cholesterol, drops. So it's very, very important that doctors recognize if we see an HDL level that's just not rising or poor HDL, LDL, we also have to look at testosterone, particularly in mid, uh, men age 40 and above. Weight gain, diabetes, hypertension, depression. Remember, testosterone for men is a feel-good hormone. It is what makes them feel young and vital. And when that drops off, you'll notice that they don't feel that way anymore. Now, new research is also supporting that when testosterone is too low, the risk of prostate cancer goes up. So with all these drugs and everything that we're utilizing, particularly when men have prostate cancer to block the free testosterone and the testosterone levels, we're finding that those drugs aren't effective because it's not testosterone that causes prostate cancer, it's the conversion of the testosterone into estrogen or dehydrotestosterone that's causing it. The things that tend to cause that conversion are estrogen levels rising and chemical pesticides, herbicides, and those types of plastic chemical, what are called xenoestrogens, are causing a rise in dehydrotestosterone and estrogen levels, which in turn is contributing to prostate cancer, but is also causing a problem with testosterone. So there's um, explanations for both as far as testosterone or low levels of testosterone cause obesity, stroke, heart attacks, and then vice versa. It's showing that men who are overweight passed a 24% um, body mass index then in turn, because they have the body fat, lower the testosterone as well. Because remember, those fat cells make you estrogenic. And they'll increase the risk of that beautiful, wonderful testosterone converting into estrogen and dehydrotestosterone. So when we're looking at the causes, I'm going to bypass the testing and talk about it in a couple of minutes. Um, we're talking again, once again, the obesity that past 24% body, body fat mass index, and most doctors will say if you're 30% or below, you're good. That ain't the case. You need to be a minimum, be, I mean, between 19 and 24% to be healthy, you can be a little bit lower. But once again, obesity contributes to low testosterone. Poor diet, too much sugar and alcohol, toting it every night, and everybody says, oh, a couple glasses of wine lower, lower my heart attack risk. 
Well, the resveratrol in the wine, yes. The alcohol, no. Because it messes with your blood sugars and it makes you gain weight. And I think that's just an excuse basically to down alcohol um, and then in turn increasing obesity. So it, I'm not going to buy it. Bottom line is if you drink alcohol on a regular basis, you're going to have a higher obesity rate and therefore lower uh, your testosterone. Nutritional deficiencies. This is a huge one. Whenever I hear a doctor say you can get everything from your food, that's a bunch of baloney. It isn't the truth. Obviously, they've not been in agriculture. I have been. And I have studied nutrition for years and years. And I have to tell you, the foods no longer contain in them what they contained 75 years ago. They now are nutrient deficient. They lack minerals. They lack vitamin C. They lack vitamin A. And then you add the soda and all the junk and all the alcohol that people are adding and all the medications that deplete your nutrients. And then you end up with low testosterone. So lack of exercise. How can you stimulate muscle and testosterone if you're not going to exercise? At least 30 minutes a day of good exercise. And we're going to talk a little bit further in the next show about the type of exercise uh, that you need to be doing as far as to stimulate uh, um, testosterone output. Um, lack of sleep. Stress and cortisol. So high stress jobs, high stress. The cortisol is also going to block your conversion of testosterone from your testosterone com from converting into free testosterone as well. Cortisol hormone interferes with women, men, all of our hormones. So reducing that cortisol is very important with exercise and then the supplements we'll talk about in our next show. The primary reason why I think we're seeing so much drop in addition to nutritional deficiencies is all the chemicals in the food. You know, there's enough chemical pesticide estrogens in a non-organic apple to change a woman's mood. So you throw those xenoestrogens, which can be molecularly six million times stronger, molecule for molecule, than the estrogens our bodies naturally produce, and you're going to end up with a high estrogen level. So plastics, pest, uh, plastics, pesticides, and chemicals. Our government allows thousands of chemicals in our food. When you buy a, a box of packaged foods, I would say probably the majority of people over half the items uh, that are on that package, no one can define or know what they are. That's scary. That's, that's just sad. Now, when you're looking at what your doctor should be looking for, and this is based upon some good research by endocrinologists, neuroscientists, of what the levels are. The studies that back these up are tremendous. So when I see a doctor say, that a man's testosterone level of 280, which is in the low, low end of normal range, is okay, that's a bunch of bull cocky. Because the studies basically supported that it had to be at least 550 in order to reduce cardiovascular risk. So if your free testosterone level, if your testosterone level is below 550 and your free testosterone level is below 20 to 25 NGs per deciliter, you're gonna have a 40% increase for causes of all deaths, mortality rate. So estimating 70 to 85 percent of men now, mind you now, I said of men, just not men age 40 and above, I said of men. So we're talking our young men too. So if the young men have borderline testosterone, then I can only imagine what's going on with our men that are 40 and above because of all these pesticides and adrenoestrogens and the poor nutrition that's going along with supporting this. I like the docs to check for also the estradiol, the DHEAS, and the vitamin D25 uh, hydroxy um, levels. Now, the score that says you gotta have 20 or above and you're healthy, that's baloney. We want it between 50 and 70. Anything above that is not necessary, and I, I wouldn't advise that. But the studies are supporting you need at least 50 on that vitamin D level score. And then I've uh, written down on here the levels that are for optimal health and optimal uh, virility and vitality. 
Being on the low end of normal is not optimal virility or vitality. Now, if you'd like copies of this, um, you can come into our stores at the Vitamin and Herb stores. And then all these shows, of course, they're show on Comcast at the scheduled times. And then thereafter, then they're on youtube.com slash vhfilm. And all of our shows are on there. Now, I am going to go over some of the foods that you want to avoid when you're trying to bolster your testosterone levels. Any foods with chemical additives, pesticides, herbicides, and that are not organic. And that doesn't mean going down to your grocery, local grocery store and getting your organics out of China. They need to be cal out of California, Texas, Oregon, or Washington. Those are the only organics that actually truly are organic and preferably sustained organic. So if you go down to your local couple markets here, you're not going to find that. Or if we can stick, like I know in our stores, we bring in Tutti Frutti Farms produce, and I know that farm is all organic, certified, and it's local. The point being is looking for local organic produce or California, Oregon, Washington are real important, Texas as well. Now, alcohol and processed sugars in all forms bring on that metabolic response and will block the testosterone production and the free testosterone conversion and will raise your estrogen levels. If you eat heavy saturated fats or trans fats, it's going to disrupt your hormones. And when you disrupt your hormones, you're not going to have wonderful testosterone levels. So now we get to the nitty gritty, foods to avoid, but the foods that you really want to increase your testosterone, your free testosterone. Now, we have a diet on, that's listed on our website uh, on YouTube, and then you can also come into the stores and get a copy of the metabolic diet or the youthful aging diet that will tell you how, how, what kinds of foods that you can eat, give you a sample menu, and that can be very, very helpful. Or you can write everything down from the shows um, as well and just write real fast or you can freeze frame it. Now, the foods that increase testosterone and free testosterone. Lean proteins, and I ain't talking about the heavy tri-tip with tons of fat. I'm talking about lean chicken breast, fish, a little bit of beef, but it needs to be extra lean. Plant-based proteins such as beans, peanuts, raw sunflower seeds, and non-denatured milk products. I'm not talking about the regular milk products you get at the grocery store that are denatured. Non-denatured milk products, which are raw milk products. Polyunsaturated fats, there's out of the Journal of Nutrition out of Japan studies, it found that essential fatty acids, particularly walnuts, almonds, pecans, flax seeds, chia seeds, and sunflower seeds, all can help stabilize hormone and help and aid testosterone levels. Broccoli, organic only. Grabbing it from your local grocery store, unless it's organic, isn't going to work. But it's uh, rich in um, indicol 3 carbonyl and DIM, which aid in the metabolism and the removal of excessive estrogens. Vitamin A rich foods, sweet potatoes, carrots, light, dark leafy greens, butternut squash. You know, everybody always panics about vitamin A, but most of uh, Americans are deficient in vitamin A. Vitamin A is necessary. You do not make testosterone unless you have adequate amount of vitamin A. So if you're not eating any vegetables or you're not supplementing, you're gonna be A deficient. Vitamin C rich foods. Now, nowadays, hmm, most of our foods do not have adequate amounts of C, so you're going to have to supplement on this. But the reason why vitamin C is so important is because it, it helps regulate cortisol. Your adrenal glands store the vitamin C, and that in turn is utilized whenever you have the fight, fight mode stress. So vitamin C or vitamin C-rich foods also help you repair all tissues and injuries. Vitamin E, they increase, or vitamin E-rich foods, increase luteinizing hormones. Spinach, almonds, sunflower seeds, greens, blueberries. Zinc-rich foods like oysters, lean meats, bean, dairy. Banana and avocados, they're rich in something called bromelain. And believe it or not, bromelain can help raise testosterone. It's an anti-inflammatory and it aids in enzyme utilization, which helps with testosterone and free testosterone conversion. Garlic. Believe it or not, garlic actually increases luteinizing hormones, and it was in the Journal of Nutrition. It can help regulate cortisol, 
which in turn can help bolster testosterone. I hope this kind of helps. Once again, you can get printouts of the diets at the stores or um, on YouTube. I strongly encourage you to start doing organics as much as you can. Make sure your plastics are all BPA free or drink out of glass or metal that you know particularly is from the United States. We're going to be moving on to the fitness portion of our show and I'm going to go through a yoga routine that can be helpful to bolster actually testosterone. Thank you very much. Hi, welcome to the fitness portion of our show. And I'm going to run through a routine called Sun Salutations, which is very stimulating for growth hormone as well as testosterone levels. It's also very helpful for females as well because we're going to be hitting in second, third chakras um, in this particular routine. And each of these uh, movements I do, you want to hold for three to five breaths, but we're just going to run through them real quickly so that you can get an idea. And it's best taught in a yoga studio or, or uh, received in a yoga studio class. But just so you have an idea, it, it can be something accomplished on own. And we start with a mountain pose, reaching up and then bending over in a forward fold. And we're bending at the hips to touch the toes and then into what's called chair pose. So we're working on the pelvic floor. Then we reach down to the floor, back into a lunge, once again working on the pelvic floor, and into push-up or plank pose, and down into what's called a downward dog. If you can see the hip flexors and all the second and third chakra are all involved. And then into what's called cobra pose, and we're gonna move up stretching all of the male members as well as that second and third chakra, curling the toes under, going into what is called downward dog again, and then bringing the left foot forward into a lunge, the right foot forward, and then back up into a mountain pose. And that routine works all of this particular area for stimulation, as well as the adrenal glands on the back of the kidneys. Next, we're going to be moving on to the research portion of our show. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the research portion of our show. And with us today is Ralph Terciano. And thank you for that intro. Mm -hmm. Well, if you have pharmaceutical stock, or invested heavily in pharmaceuticals, I should say, you may want to start rethinking that investment. Why? Because one of the major, major profit makers for drug companies is cholesterol-lowering medications. There's one major flaw that was recently announced in what's called the Landmark Study. This Landmark Study was released June 6th of this year, obviously 2012, and has not made the news. What is this study? Well, it says, quote, and keep in mind, this was published in the June 6th Journal of Nature Communi Communications, provided I can communicate. The real culprit behind hardened arteries, stem cells, says the landmark study. They said one of the top suspects behind killer vascular diseases is the victim of my mistaken identity. The guilty party is not the smooth muscle cells within the blood vessels walls, which for decades was thought to combine with cholesterol and fat, then then clogged arteries. Instead, a previously unknown type of stem cell, what's called a multipotent vascular stem cell, is to blame. The finding that a stem cell population contributes to artery, artery hardening diseases, such as arterial sclerosis, provides a promising new direction for future research. Let's see how fast they move on that research. They said this is groundbreaking research and provocative work for the main reason it challenges existing dogma. It is generally accepted that the buildup of artery blocking plaque stems from the body's immune system response to vessel damage caused by low density lipoproteins, LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol. Many people try to eliminate that cholesterol from their diets, such as diets. 
Such damage attracts legions of white blood cells and can spur the formation of fibrous scar tissue that accumulates within the vessel, narrowing the blood flow. The scar tissue, known as neotenema, has certain characteristics of smooth muscle, the dominant type of tissue in the blood vessel wall. Because mature smooth muscle cells no longer multiply and grow, it is theorized that in the course of the inflammatory response that this basically would cause your arteries to clog and harden. Keep in mind, theorized. It's not even really a theory, it was a hypothesis. According to the researchers, they said, however, no experiments were ever published to demonstrate what they call differentiation process. So this whole cholesterol industry is built upon a science which hasn't even been studied thoroughly yet. The different phenotypes that gave us this clue was the stem cells that were involved. The stem cells were involved with concern was ones that develop up bone, uh, calcified, um, you know, anything from cartilage, you name it, and also smooth muscle. So it said, in the later stage of the vascular disease, the soft vessels become hardened and more brittle, obviously. And, and previously, there was controversy about how soft tissue would become hard. The ability of stem cells to form bone or cartilage could explain the calcification of blood vessels. When the blood vessel walls were damaged, the stem cells, rather than mature to smooth muscle cells, became activated and started to multiply, calcify. Keep in mind, they're not saying cholesterol is responsible for hardening your arteries anymore. That basically stem cells gone bad. In fact, they totally debunked the cholesterol hypothesis altogether. So keep in mind, if a person now is taking cholesterol-lowering medications that can create side effects and things like that, they're taking the cholesterol-lowering medications based upon fear and not science. Science, hopefully over time, will overrule the fear of going off a of cholesterol-lowering medication. It's not the same as a lucky rabbit's foot because lucky rabbit's foots don't have side effects either. They also said, quote, if your target is wrong, then your treatment can't be very effective. All right, June 6th. Let's see how long this takes before it actually makes the news. After that, Crohn's disease. Now, researchers came upon an interesting discovery when they were trying to figure out whether sugar caused Crohn's disease. Well, they found out that sugar didn't. So they wanted to play around with some of the artificial sweeteners. And guess what? All of a sudden, the E. coli bacteria, which triggers Crohn's disease, now keep in mind Crohn's disease is basically this, a normal healthy human gut keeps bacteria separated from the intestinal walls. In Crohn's disease, the bacteria of the biofilms, especially from E. coli, uh, tend to basically adhere straight to the intestinal walls where it does not belong and causing inflammation and so on and so forth. Well, they discovered an additive to the artificial sweeteners and they actually said, quote unquote, Splenda and or equal, uh, maltodextrin was what triggered it. They say there's now a clear link between bacteria and inflammatory bowel diseases. They reviewed how certain components of the diet alter E. coli bacteria to increase your ability to form biofilms. Biofilms help to propagate and stick and adhere to the intestinal epithel uh, epithelial cells, features associated with the disease. The investigators grew E. coli bacteria isolated from Crohn's disease patients in the lab with different substances found in the Western diet and tested their ability to form biofilm structures, especially those found in the gut of Crohn's disease patients. Initially, they were fed artificial sweeteners. Surprisingly, Dr. McDonald's group found that the sweeteners alone did not have an effect, but maltodextrin dramatically changed the bacteria. It says, right now, it's too early to conclude just the maltodextrin alone promotes the disease. But however, though, they do say maltodextrin, which if you look at the ingredients, your food, some of your lower quality vitamins and things like that, you're going to find maltodextrin everywhere. And so ironically, it's tearing your gut apart. They said the maltodextrin can cause E. coli to gain features associated with disease and therefore potentially increase an individual's overall risk of developing inflammatory bowel disease. Now keep in mind, we're talking E. coli and maltodextrin make a good team of tearing and get apart. So it may not just affect inflammatory bowel diseases, but food poisoning on its own too. 
which kind of makes it interesting as far as when they feed the, all these cattle grain. If the maltodextrin from the grain is somehow causing E. coli to propagate and therefore make its way to the food supply. You got Crohn's disease or intestinal disorders or are worried about E. coli? Really, stay away from maltodextrin is what researchers said. Bottom line, this was from the clinic, the Cleveland Clinic of Learning Research Institute. All right, now for those with cancer. An interesting study on American ginseng. And they found out that American ginseng had no side effects when it came to uh, working with cancer patients. But this is what they discovered, especially when it came to fatigue. And this study was actually done by the Mayo Clinic. And it's also printed in the American Society of Clinical Oncology in their annual meeting. Again, this came out in June. They basically gave participants 2,000 milligrams of American ginseng. That's two grams of ground American ginseng root. Not Panax ginseng, but American ginseng. At four weeks, they discovered that the American ginseng only gave slight improvement in fatigue systems. Now, what they had is they had a 100-point scale, all right, where they rated people, patients rated the fatigue, compared to a placebo. This was just not one single study as far as a one thing. At eight weeks, though, took about two months, the ginseng offered cancer patients significant improvement in general exhaustion, feelings about what their words are pooped, worn out, fatigued, sluggish, run down, and tired compared to the placebo group. They also said, quote, and I'll repeat it, after eight weeks, we saw 20-point improvement in cancer patients measured on a 100-point standardized fatigue scale, and the herb had no apparent side effects said 90% of cancer patients experience fatigue. Fatigue in cancer patients has been linked to an increase in the immune inflammatory cytokines and as well the poorly regulated levels of the stress hormone cortisol. They believe that the geniocides in the American ginseng have been shown in animal studies to reduce cytokines related to inflammation and then for help regulate cortisol levels. They also said cancer is a prolonged stress experience which the fatigue can last at least 10 years, even after successful treatment of chemo. All right, now we go to Alzheimer's. We don't have much time left, but we'll run at this. High blood levels of caffeine were shown to reduce Alzheimer's. As much as three, cup of coffee, three cups of coffee per day over a two, year, two to four year period of time in people with mild cognitive impairment, actually, when they were doing three cups of coffee a day, never slipped or had any progression of symptoms of Alzheimer's compared to those which did not. Mm -hmm. right, my time is up. Thank you very much. And we'll finish it there. Thank you very much, Ralph. Once again, do your research and we'll be next addressing uh, testosterone part two in our next show. Thank you very much. Bye. -bye.